We are back live and we're taking up S254. Um, uh, and we're at the point of committee discussion, although I will invite comments from those who are in the room. Um, we, try, we try to keep everybody appraised of what's going on, who have testified on the bill. And uh, so I, I, um, I appreciate all the different sides that have, and I'm going to say sides because, you know, usually say there's one side and another side, and then, you know, the two sides you come to compromise with. In this particular bill, it seems like there's five or six different sides, and we're hearing conflicting information from all of those sides. And I, I want to make clear that the, the bill we're talking about um, is not designed to tear down police or anything of that nature. It is designed to have a discussion about qualified immunity. And Ben has helped us very nicely understand the history of qualified immunity. Ben Novogoski, our legislative counsel, has done a terrific job in working on this bill. And um, the legislature has never actually had a voice in this. It's all been done through common law and um, rulings by Vermont Supreme Court as well as the United States Supreme Court. And I want to make clear it's, it's our job to look into these matters. Um, and really at the heart of the issue for me is the balance between civil rights and civil policing. This bill is about striking that balance with a uniform policy that applies alike to local, county, and state police. Um, and I've read a lot of criticism of the bill regarding frivolous lawsuits. And I just want to make a few comments about that, and then we can, uh, I'm happy to hear from others, but um, you know, that's something as chair of this committee and as a member of this committee, um, I've heard often is frivolous lawsuits and the worry about it. We, we're hearing that about the right to farm, for example, in S-268. Um, but there are barriers to filing frivolous lawsuits, including attorney sanctions and judges' ability to dismiss cases. And in general, Vermont is not that kind of litigious, litigious state with runaway lawsuits. And one of the things that was in the bill as introduced was loser pays. In other words, if uh, there is a lawsuit against a um, law enforcement officer, that at least the intent of the sponsors of the bill, including myself, was that to avoid those frivolous lawsuits, the um, officer would be indemnified for any of the costs of uh, defending him or herself in the lawsuit. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I'm kind of disappointed that that hasn't even come up in the discussion uh, by many of the uh, opponents of the bill. I saw um, when my town manager forwarded me a blurb from VLCT, and I didn't hear anything about that, about that portion of the bill. And I maybe it's just because it was overlooked. But um, that was put in there to avoid, to try to uh, avoid frivolous lawsuits. And if there are and they get to that point, you know, I've been sued. I know what it's like. I know what it feels like. It doesn't feel good. And um, because of the way it all turned out, it cost me $22,000 to defend myself on a lawsuit that took the jury about, well, I think the amount of time it took them to walk to the jury room and back, they couldn't have had more than a half a minute to discuss the bill, to discuss the suit and came back and found us to not be at fault. Um, by the way, when we're talking about the jury bill, that was a jury of eight people. So 
um, I just needed to get that off my chest and I appreciate that. Um, but so Ben, um, can you help us better understand the Zulu case and what it did, what it didn't do? And sure. Um, Am I it correctly? Is it Zulu? It's the Zulu v. State. Um, okay. And yes, uh, and for the record, Ben Novogrosky from the Office of Legislative Counsel. The, the Zulu case, to really distill it down simply, is that for state constitutional torts as applied to state law enforcement, uh, they, uh, a standard was created, a four-part standard, um, that, and, and again, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I guess, maybe broadening it a little bit more because it's, Zulu is specifically about Article 11, the search and seizure provision. And uh, the standard came out of this case that to obtain damages, and it was really a damages limiting principle that sort of acted as a form of qualified immunity, that to obtain damages in any claim, a plaintiff must show that um, there was a violation of Article 11, that there was no meaningful alternative in the context of that particular case, and that the law enforcement officer acting under authority of the state or within the scope of authority um, knew or should have known that the officer was violating clearly established law or that the officer acted in bad faith. So that standard is really what came out of the Zulo case. Um, but it's unclear as far as its application to local law enforcement to other constitutional violations, but there is sort of a conventional wisdom that, that it, it would at least be instruct, instructive as applied to other situations. And one of the reasons why this, uh, why this standard exists, I, I suppose, is because Vermont's constitution often offers broader protections than the federal counterpart. Um, and so that's why this, one of the reasons why this, this standard was created. And also, um, as was said in previous testimony, to try to balance the considerations where um, to, to stave off a wave of lawsuits um, against law enforcement that could um, obstruct the performance of their duties. Um, so the court felt that this was a damages limiting principle to try and address all of those considerations. Um, and, but there was a, a call and they said absent legislative action, this is what we're, this is the standard that we would apply in at least this situation and perhaps similar situations of constitutional violations of the Vermont constitution. Um, so there was a call, uh, I think for legislative action. Um, to a degree. Um, but until that happens, that is the standard in um, that context of at least Article 11 violations and potentially more constitutional violations. What? Are there questions so far about that? So, uh, Senator White. So, if we did nothing, this is the standard that would be used from now on in Vermont around um, the Article 11 violations. For Article 11 violations as applied to state police, state, yeah. I could say pretty confidently that this would be the standard that, that would be used. However, it may not be used in other contexts. Right, right, but, but in, Anything under the, uh, an Article 11 violation, this would be the standard used. Yes. It, we were just talking about dep sheriffs in the, uh, in the um, agenda item ahead of this one. If a sheriff did it, a county sheriff, would they be covered by Zulu? I can't say with certainty that they would. Um, 
I think that Zulo would probably be instructive in the case, um, but there is uncertainty over um, different officers because local law enforcement and sheriffs are a, a little bit different since they're county based, but local law enforcement has, and, and this is a discussion that's gone on, there's municipal immunity and whether or not that applies to local law enforcement is sort of an inconsistent question throughout the case law. Um, there are many cases where local municipal employees, so someone that works for the water department, municipal immunity is a completely different test, but it would apply to them. However, there's inconsistency in the case law as applied to law enforcement specifically. Um, many, the majority of the cases that come out of Vermont are cases involving uh, state troopers. There are a handful though that involve local law enforcement. However, it's not clear the tests that they apply in that situation. It could be municipal immunity, but also there's, there's qualified immunity. There are two cases um, that I'm aware of, BAP TV Bruno and Livingston v. Town of Hartford that involve local law enforcement, but it's not a clear application of this, the clearly established law standards that we've talked about under 1983 lawsuits. Um, there hasn't been a case really yet about with the Zulo standard, um, but there's also discussion about this municipal sort of discretionary proprietary function as well. So it's a really long way of saying that it's unclear how it would apply to sheriffs. Um, and the one thing that I think could be a, is a policy decision for the, for the committee to consider is that if there is a consistent standard that the committee wants to apply to situations across the board to give certainty and uniformity across for state police, sheriffs, and local law enforcement so that the, the courts don't vary in their interpretations. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, Sh uh, Senator White, and then Commissioner Shirley. So I just have one more question for Ben on the Zulo case. I mean, I might have more, but right now I have one. Um, it only applies to constitutional rights, violation of constitutional rights, on, on art, specifically Article 11 constitutional rights. Specifically that... Article 11, yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thanks for being here. Thank you, Senator. Uh, sorry, I was a few minutes late. I was on uh, the House side uh, for a bit. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, I, I don't want to sound uh, or come across as argumentative with uh, uh, council, but um, I've, and I've been texting a few folks uh, while this has been going on. Um, we're not aware of any instance where uh, controlling case law on a decision involving a law enforcement officer in Vermont in any way differs whether that officer is municipal, sheriff, or state police. There's only one definition of a law enforcement officer in the state. We train to the same, uh, when we train about legal obligations, both civil and criminal process, they're identical. My experience with civil litigation now, both in on the municipal side and on the state side, is that um, we, when we're considering uh, cases that are brought against law enforcement agencies, that all of the uh, decisions are controlling in Vermont. So Zulo, in to, by extension, would be controlling to municipal agencies as well. Um, important to note, I am not an attorney, but I would certainly urge you to get additional. Um, legal uh, opinions on this because I am quite confident that uh, Zulo applies across the board, as do other decisions um, related to both civil liability and criminal procedure. Senator White. So I just want to ask Ben <clears throat> one more question. And I will always have one more question, probably. I am so sorry. But well, Why? I thought your question was for Commissioner Sherling, so I'm going to thank oh, no. Commissioner Sherling. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Commissioner. No. Um, I, 
I think that, um, so I'm curious as to why we're phrasing this in uh, eliminating qualified immunity instead of putting it in um, the context, and maybe I don't understand the way the, law, the laws are written, but that in order to obtain damages, which is what we're looking at, we're looking at the rights of people to, to have to get damages if they've been damaged by a law enforcement officer. And that, that I think is the, what we're looking at here. So why aren't we putting those four standards under some piece of legislation that says, in order to um, get damages from uh, an action of a law enforcement officer, you need to meet these stand four standards. Why are we, I mean, is it the same outcome or um, why, why have we phrased it um, getting rid of qualified immunity as opposed to these are the standards you need to meet in order to file a lawsuit and get damages? Well, Senator White, that's, that's I think, a, a policy consideration for, for the committee. And, you know, on the one hand, what qualified immunity does is stop a lawsuit really at its outset. So you a lot oftentimes you don't even get to the merits of the case and even the question of damages. I think the the route that you're suggesting uh, could potentially change that that um, that equation, where it is possible that the committee could create a, a a law that would permit the lawsuit to go forward, and then when it comes to the remedy, as opposed to just having access to the court system. Um, the remedy is sort of what the the policy choice would be if, if it's damage access to damages or or something else. Um, I think that is a policy consideration. But right now, qualified immunity oftentimes acts as really an obstacle to really access the court system to a degree. Okay. Um, Th that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That. Um, I wonder if um, Jay Diaz wants to comment, because Jay um, it was actually one of the litigators in the Zulu case. On the issue that I'm really stumbling about, and Commissioner Sherling raised it, it is Zulu specifically to the state police, or could it encompass all, all law enforcement in the state? Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the record, Jay Diaz, General Counsel of ACLU Vermont. Uh, yes, I, uh, I was part of the team that litigated the case, uh, Zulu v. State. And as Ben said, I think I, I would agree with Ben uh, that the case specifically applies to state police or state employees, really. And that's because it was a case against the state itself. Uh, and so while Article 11 and the rulings in Zulu around Article 11 specifically, yes, those apply across the board. So those are like search and seizure, that's search and seizure law. The law around damages and, um, uh, and, and this limiting principle that Ben talked about, this qualified immunity-like test that we've talked about, that is specific to the state. Now, it could in future cases be ruled to apply to municipal officers in some fashion or, or sheriffs, but that remains to be seen. We haven't had a case on point in that regard. So I think, you know, that that's what, I think what Ben was trying to get at and, and that's uh, what, that's how I read the case. Nice. And the case is limited to redress for significant violations. That's constitutionally based violations. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay. And the court said absent legislation providing a meaningful remedy for constitutional tort violations. Well, I should read the full statement. The, the legislature may provide and limit a statutory remedy for constitutionally based tort violations as long as the remedy provides meaningful redress for significant violations. 
meaningful redress, absent legislation providing a meaningful remedy for constitutional court violations, in determining the scope and limits of sovereign immunity, we conclude that the judge-made doctrine does not superside the right of the people to seek redress from the state for violations of fundamental constitutional rights. Yes, so there the court is saying that the state, through its statutes, can't waive immunity, can't waive sovereign immunity, or, or, or can't apply sovereign immunity, I'm sorry. And it has to um, give some form of meaningful redress when constitutional rights are violated. Because there's no legislation um, providing any standard, the court basically uh, is setting the floor here. Thank you. That, that does help me a little bit. I don't know if it helps others, but it, what does significant mean, by the way? I don't know that the word significant there has any... Um, What's it, a it, significant it, violation, I should say? Yeah, I think that's where I think the court is maybe drawing a floor, but is saying... But it didn't elaborate on that fact. I think if you look at what happened in Zulo, you see a young person, a young black man who, who was you know, just driving his car, was pulled over without justification. His car, uh, he was pulled out of the car, had his car towed and seized, had it searched, all without justification. Uh, those, things, those are the types of things I would consider significant violations of constitutional rights. Okay, Senator White, um, thank Th you, Jay. Th thanks, Jay, but it only applies to significant violations of Article 11, right? So, yes, Zolo is specific to, and, and the, those limiting principles we talked about, the limiting principle we talked about is specific to Article 11 violation. It is not the same test for other violations of state constitutional rights. Thank you. Other questions for Jay or for anyone who's in the room? Anyone in the room who wants to comment on this discussion? I'm happy to hear from you. Brad, you're muted. You hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Uh, I just want to go back to your uh, concerns about frivolous lawsuits and yeah. issues that have been raised around that. Um, as I said last time. Could you identify yourself for the record? I'm sorry. No way Bradley Meyerson. Um, I am retired but still licensed attorney. Paulette. Uh, I've testified and, and reinforced this in letters uh, to the committee that um, the concern about frivolous lawsuits is a non-issue based upon the statute having, as you identified, Senator Sears, um, a loser pays provision, but also concerns about frivolous lawsuits ignore the fact that A, Vermont simply does not have that type of litigation climate, and sub B, uh, the plaintiff's attorney, and I can say this from my own long experience, performs a screening function in terms of whether it is worth the risk on a contingent fee basis to handle such a claim and take it to trial, uh, knowing that among other things, he or she will have to spend a lot of money out of their own pocket for experts and to prepare the case, and also because um, of facing the prospect of loser pays. So I, I, I don't think that the fear of a wave of frivolous lawsuits is a genuine concern and should not be an obstacle to passage of the bill. Yeah, they usually... I was watching Channel 13 News this morning and saw somebody in New York was sued. The uh, guy who runs a store was sued for requiring the guy to have a mask on during the mask mandate in New York. And he was sued for a quarter of a million dollars by somebody who, who didn't want to put a mask on and said he was practicing medicine without a degree. That was the basis of the lawsuit. So, of course, that grabs headlines. And, you know, like I said, most people are afraid of lawsuits. They don't want them. They don't want to have to 
you know, and I'm sure the guy that runs the grocery store doesn't want to defend himself against that type of lawsuit. Um, anyhow, that's what I get for watching TV. Anybody else who wants to comment, welcome. Um, can I get back to Mr. Ben? Mr. Chair? Yes, Karen Horn, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, the one comment that I would have is that is in response sort of to, to the um, comment that um, frivolous lawsuits don't happen in Vermont but you are changing the landscape here. And so what has been the case in the past may not actually be the case in the future. I, I just want to um, yeah, point that I, out to the committee. On page two, line 16, and I, this is where I got into a kind of a disagreement. Internet's unstable, so I hope I don't lose you. But I've been emailing back and forth with Stu Hurd, the town manager of Bennington, um, who forwarded a copy of your um, article regarding the S-250, S-254. And his comments back and forth was, if the sponsors all only want litigation, that's all you're getting out of this is more litigation. And after reading you know, what he forwarded me, I, I was merely pointing out that on line 16, it says a court may award reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred in any action brought under this section in which the plaintiff substantially prevailed. When a judgment is entered in favor of a defendant, a court may award reasonable attorney fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred to the defendant for defending any claims the court finds frivolous. So I, I, that language wasn't recognized in the article that you sent. That's all I was referencing. And Stu didn't pick up on that language. So I was pointing out that the language is in the bill as introduced. Okay. And then it further- We do know it's in there. Yeah, well, um, and then it further says on line 10 of page three, notwithstanding any provision of this section to the contrary, to the extent that a law enforcement officer, officer's portion of the judgment or settlement is uncollectible from a law enforcement officer, law enforcement agency, a law enforcement agency's insurance will satisfy any such uncollected amount of the judgment or settlement. Uh, just pointing out what's in the bill. Thank and you. We can agree to disagree about frivolous lawsuits. I appreciate the perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Ben? Or anybody else in the room who would like to comment at this point? Right, I don't know that we're making much progress, but if you were to draft something that um, was based on the Zulu case to make clear that, it, you know, there seems to be a disagreement whether it covers municipal and other employees. And we were to draft something uh, that codifies Zulu for constitutional violations, of people's rights. And it included the language that I just read in, in um, on page two regarding the um, frivolous lawsuits. Does that do, I mean, do you need more direction from us to try to do something like that? Well, I think um, I could draft something that would codify the Zulu standard. Um, and then as far as the, you know, and, and that would be something that would be uh, a burden that the plaintiff would have to prove um, and really would be one that would speak to whether damages what was what was appropriate in the case. Um, and it would really involve those three prongs outlined um, in the Zulu case. And I think, you know, for it to apply 
more uniformly, if that's the choice of the committee, uh, to make it apply to all law enforcement officers in the state. Um, and then it would it would discuss, or uh, I think that the, the standard would be that, you know, a law, it would be a, a violation of the rights, privileges, or immunities guaranteed by the Constitution of the state of Vermont, rather than just limiting it, limiting it to Article 11 or, or another similar article, that there would be no other meaningful alternative in the context of the case, and that the law enforcement officer either knew that um, the officer was violating clearly established law or that the officer acted in bad faith. I, I think that can be drafted in such a way that it would be a standard applied uniformly. And then as far as the, the frivolous lawsuit concern, I mean, if there are suggestions as far as to, um, I think, further deter frivolous lawsuits, that's something that can be worked in as well. Um, it just depends sort of what, what the choices are on what's appropriate to incorporate. Um, there are other states do incorporate some language that's a little bit more um, uh, aggressive isn't the right word, but maybe more of a deterrent of friv frivolous lawsuits. Um, so for instance, um, in Connecticut, I believe that they used a language that if um, the lawsuit was uh, involved willful conduct or reckless conduct, and excuse me, I'm not, uh, quoting it directly, so there might be some deviation in what in what I'm saying right now, um, but that can be added to the provision that we already have. Um, so it could read something along the lines of um, that you know a court may award reasonable attorneys' fees and other litigation costs reasonably occurred um, under this chapter uh, in which the plaintiff substantially prevailed or um, if the defendant acted in bad faith um, or if the court finds that uh, there was bad faith, when a judgment is entered in favor of a defendant, a court may award reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation uh, costs for any claims the court finds frivolous. Um, and we could add additional language to that um, to act as to give the court more discretion to make findings that the, the court or that the case was brought in a frivolous way, maybe that the, the, the case was uh, brought with malintent or, um, or somehow uh, was trying to deter a police officer's otherwise lawful conduct, something along those lines. But I think that really comes down to the committee's choices as to um, what they want, what it wants to do as far as um, incorporating more deterrent language. Was was that part of Connecticut's qualified immunity law or is it part of just state law in Connecticut? Um, no, it's part of their, their recent qualified immunity law that was passed. And I, I apologize for not having the exact- Oh, that's language. fine, that, that's fine. We're, I, I'm, this is more like committee discussion and getting somewhere to, so I, I that's fine, I just, um, I think there personally, I, I, I'm comfortable with having something of that nature in there either, you know, maybe you could draft something up based on Connecticut, and then we have the choice of what's in the bill currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually I do have the, the language now if, uh, if you, if, if you want to, uh, if you don't mind indulging me. No, um, no, go ahead. So there, the language in the Connecticut uh, bill was that in any civil action brought um, under this section, if the court finds that a violation of the section was deliberate, willful, or committed with reckless indifference, the plaintiff may be awarded costs and a reasonable attorney's fees. But that was, they don't have it on the flip side that the defendant may. But my point is that there could be language of a similar nature that could be applied to either a plaintiff or a defendant um, yeah. to award them attorney's fees. Well, I, I think it's important to have something in there for the defendant. So, Under White. So, so Ben, I'm not sure I completely understood that because currently there is something in there that if the 
case is won or lost that the defendant and the plaintiff will have to pay each other. But you're saying that if it doesn't even get to that point, but is considered a frivolous lawsuit to begin with and never gets to that point that the that there could be uh, that yeah. reimbursement. Right. And I mean, the court would have to make that fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there would be litigation to a degree. Um, it's it's not a total prevention. Um, but what we could do is work in language to give the court more discretion to award the defendant fees other than just for frivolous cases. Um, it could be one, like I said, brought with malintent or maybe in retribution for otherwise lawful conduct, something of that nature. Um, but, but again, it doesn't prevent the lawsuit at the outset. It would still require a finding by the court after the lawsuit was commenced. Okay, I got it. Thank you. I, if, if I just can comment here that Ben is a saint putting up with my questions. Oh my God, um, no. Well, he's terrific, but I, I don't know if we want to give him sainthood yet. I, well, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm, I am fallible, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you have an, oh, oh, is there a way to incorporate some kind of report? To better understand the number of cases, the number of, you know. Yeah, there that, seems to be a great deal of confusion, at least from my perspective, about, you know, the number of cases that, come up in Vermont. This doesn't at all affect the federal cases, correct? I mean, it, somebody, we don't have any control over that. Right. This would just be for violations of the state constitution. Um, right. You know, there would still be the avenues for a section 1983 claim in, in federal court, which can also be brought in state court, but only for violations of the federal uh, con federal constitutional rights. But yes, it, this would be exclusive to state constitutional violations. And, and I think what you're suggesting, Senator Sears, is, is uh, another provision that's similar to what was in New Mexico's statute. Um, they do have uh, a report that would be published um, about the number of cases that have been filed and things like that. So I think that's something that could be worked into to an amendment as well. Yeah, that's what I had in mind. Something like New Mexico. Um, unfortunately, Senator Baruth is not here, so it's hard to get a feeling of the committee at, today. I, I feel like this is more just trying to get us going somewhere in a redraft of the bill after listening to, as I said, all six sides of the issue, or seven, whatever it is. Um, I mean, I are there other things people would like to see or not see in a bill? Or maybe some of you don't want to even have a bill. But. In the, uh, Senator Mike, Commissioner, uh, yeah. Safety yeah, on, the, Mike. on your last point, um, I, will, uh, I will take that position and simply say, um, you know, it is our experience that there are avenues, plenty of avenues to, uh, to litigate law enforcement. Um, also of importance, I don't know if this point has even been made, um, when, when law enforcement um, does find itself in a position where someone's rights have been violated or someone has been wronged or injured in a way um, where compensation is appropriate, there is rarely, uh, if ever, uh, a hesitation uh, to make that right. Um, and my final point, uh, going back to the very beginning of my testimony, uh, we should be investing in better outcomes, not working on more ways to create litigation. Uh, I continue to fear the cascading impacts of um, a variety of different things, including our policy decisions on our ability to recruit and retain and ultimately deliver uh, public safety services in Vermont and passing anything of this nature, which is going to create additional litigation is going to damage our ability to operate. 
So I'll just pick up from the commissioner's statement. I met the commissioner when he came before our human rights commission and he was still chief of police. Um, I have to concur with him that there are many avenues for people to get relief here. I remain frustrated that this conversation um, has arisen at a time when the, the frustration being expressed is really concentrated on the national level and not the state level. Um, I've pontificated on this subject last time. I don't mean to belabor the point, but Senator Sears, you asked the question of whether you just don't want a bill at all, and that is my position still. Senator White. Well, I continue to, to um, look at this because I, I do think that people need to have the, um, people who are damaged need to have the um, ability to recoup those damages. I don't know if, if what we currently have is sufficient. I don't know that this is the right approach, but I will say one thing, people, um, in testimony, one of the things that we hear constantly is that this would um, improve police accountability. And I don't believe for a second that that is true. I think that, that we are working on many, many avenues to improve police accountability. We have, um, we've been working on it for years. We changed the uh, Criminal Justice Council. The Criminal Justice Council is now operating in a a really different and very um, professional manner. The two chairs of it are um, Mark Anderson and Susanna Davis. They are working really hard to um, make police accountable. There's a professional regulations uh, subcommittee that's work really working and, and it's taking them a little bit of time, more time than we had hoped because of COVID because they can't meet in person and so they're doing everything on Zoom. So it is taking longer, but they are working really hard. And we have other, um, other bills before us that would address police accountability. And we have been working on that. So whether this is the right way to give people access to damages that they incur, um, I do not believe that it is the, the uh, way to improve police accountability. There are many, many, many other things. The training, we worked on establishing the three levels. I mean, we've been doing this for years. So this is not something, something new. And um, I, I do take offense when people say that the um, law enforcement in Vermont has not been willing to work on changes and not been willing to to um, engage in these conversations. So I just, I just needed to put that out there that no matter where I land, I do not believe this <laughs> improves accountability. And I do not believe that law enforcement in Vermont has been um, uh, negligent in coming or um, uncooperative in trying to um, improve what was already probably a better culture than in most other states. So thank you. You. Well, I, I do think there is strong support for law enforcement in Vermont. I don't think we're like some other states where we don't see it, but we have pockets where um, and groups that feel marginalized. Um, and we heard from many of those folks early on in testimony. Um, and so. I, if this bill doesn't pass, it's not the end of the world. And we have raised an issue that I think deserves to be discussed after 55 years of not having a legislative committee look at qualified immunity, um, which was um, invented by the courts, not by legislation. Um, I, was an interesting email from Mark Hughes, and unfortunately he can't be here with us this morning, about the history of qualified immunity and what it originally was designed for. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if you all got that email, but Peggy, um, if you want to send it out or post it, it's, I think it's fine. 
Um, it's interesting, um, the history of qualified immunity. So it, it was, you know, done by the courts and not by the legislature. And I think that's one of the reasons that I um, have moved forward with this bill. Um, I, my respect and admiration for 99% of the law enforcement officers, if not 99.9%, has .9 not changed at all. And I have the greatest respect for them. And my respect for, um, and we, in, in our earlier discussion about sheriffs, I you know, have a great deal of respect for them um, and trying to work with them on courthouse security. Uh, it's not about me trying to tear down police, but rather trying to make sure that we do the best we can. Um, but where it ends, um, we shall see. Any other Mr. comments from anyone? Yeah, Senator Benning, yeah. Yeah, I read Mark Hughes's um, email, and it's one of the frustrating parts of all this. He's addressing the national judiciary um, and section 1983 specifically. Um, and, and I have to say again, this has no impact on the national level whatsoever, including 1983 actions. But I think that's the driving force of many of the folks who are interested in this legislation because there are problems on the national level. And surely that needs to be addressed by the United States Supreme Court. But in Vermont, we have one of the most progressive Supreme Courts in the nation. And I have every reason to believe they would not stand in the way of providing someone with a remedy who deserves a remedy. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that we've intermingled the conversation with the national frustration uh, being used as a force to drive something to change in Vermont, which I have yet to be convinced needs to be changed. Okay, but if I look at what I heard about Zulo, that was certainly a case that happened in Vermont that the Supreme Court has found to be wrong. And to write that, they have um, made law case law. And what, what I've also heard is that that may or may not apply to local police, municipal police, and other law enforcement officers in the state. And where I'm headed right now is looking at how to make sure that that applies to everyone. And if Zulo is the standard in Vermont, then why wouldn't it be the standard for all law enforcement I personally, if I'm being asked to respond to that, I think it is. And wouldn't the Supreme Court would not hesitate to apply it. But Zulo, one of the other issues with it is it's a fact specific case. They had a state police question in front of them. Um, I think if a municipal question came up, whether a, a, um, a local law enforcement officer was the subject of the discussion, they wouldn't hesitate to extend that uh, to that law enforcement officer. And I'm worried that in this time period that we're living in, uh, the other consequences that may result, even if there aren't frivolous lawsuits, and I, I, by the way, I don't believe there will be an avalanche of frivolous lawsuits, but I agree completely with Karen Horn that we are changing the landscape. And when you change the landscape, the recruitment efforts of the state police and other law enforcement is impacted. To what extent, I don't know that we know, but I have to believe if you are coming into that profession from the ground floor, uh, you have to think twice about what your legal responsibilities are, and they have to train to that. I should also shout out that when I was on government operations, um, there was a lot of effort in trying to redesign police training programs to make sure they were cognizant of the issues that we're now 
discussing is the foundation of this particular legislation. And I don't know that they've had enough time to have those things work, but I do know that they have been uh, bending over backwards to participate in those conversations. And when I was on government operations, I was very impressed that they were willing to, to sit down at the table and try to do what they could to make amends um, for whatever reasons amends were needed. But I, I hesitate to try to use this legislation out of frustration of what's going on at the national level. When in the reality, we this legislation has nothing to do with what's going on at the national level. Could I just add a comment about the um, application sure. to other sure. to other uh, law enforcement officers? I and I think what Ben was saying was that he 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 really can't speak for the court. He's our attorney, and he can't speak for the court and say that it definitely would apply because this was a case, a fact specific case, it applied to the Vermont State Police. It did not apply, but he, I don't think he was saying that it wouldn't apply, that he was saying he couldn't speak for the courts. But I think that Mike, the commissioner and Joe are right that it would, it, it would apply, but um, I don't think that Ben was saying it wouldn't apply. Sorry to speak for you, Ben. Well, let Ben speak for himself. <laughs> thank you, Senator Susan. Yeah, thank you, Senator White. Um, and yeah, and to clarify that point, it, 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 Senator White, you, you pretty much captured it for me. Is that you know I'm not saying that it won't apply. It's just that there isn't hasn't been a case that definitively says that. And I just feel that my role um, is to try to capture that you know as objectively as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think. And given how litigators operate, it's possible that you, if there is another case, there could be an argument that it doesn't apply given the circumstances, but it also could. The, my, my point is just that it is not definitive given the outcome of the Zulo case, given the specific facts of that case. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm being overly cautious, but I, I feel like that's also, um, you know, what what the aim is in my role. Well, not being a lawyer, throughout the Zulo, there's like five or six times when the court says things like absent implement, implementing legislation, when the legislature has not created an alternative civil remedy, in the absence of any applicable legislation addressing constitutional torts, we are cognizant of our need to be cautious when, judi when judiciary recognizing potential damage liability to both be imposed on another branch of government. Retaining limited immunity prevents judicial branch from intruding upon functions of the legislative and executive branches through adjudication of tort suits. If the Supreme Court wasn't inviting the legislature to act. I don't know how many more times they could say it. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And if, if we don't, if we decide not to, it's not going to be the end of the world. We, we killed about four bills here this year, um, much to the dismay of many of the supporters of the bills. And, you know, if we do that here, we do it. I, that's not going to be the end of the day for me. Um, you know, and we all know several of the, I'm sure that people who wanted to see a no knock warrants bill are disappointed in our action not to pursue it. But that's the decision we made as a committee. And if we make the decision to not pursue this any further, so be it. We've spent a lot of time on it, but that's the way it is. I would just like to respond, Senator Sears, quickly by saying, you may not be a lawyer, sir, but you know a lot more about the law and how the laws dovetail with each other than a lot of lawyers that I do know. Well, thank so, you, Senator. Whatever that's worth. Thank you. Senator Nick. So um, as I had said previously, um, you know, I feel we've done through the years that we've been on this, that I've been on this committee, 
Um, we've done a lot of work to improve um, policing. Um, it, it was, some of it was very difficult to get to where we did get, but starting, I think, back in 2017, I mean, I have made some notes here, Act 56 was enacted, which established new provisions for the professional regulation of law enforcement officer. In 2020, we passed Act 147, defining prohibited restraints. Um, Act 165 established uh, a use of force standard. Act 166 addressed the collection of roadside, roadside stop data and use of body cameras. Um, uh, let's see. So anyway, just looking at some of those, there was a, there's been an expanded and restructuring of the Criminal Justice Council that reports requires law enforcement agencies to report credible complaints of professional misconduct to the council. The, you know, there's all these things that we have been writing on, and in Jeanette's committee now, there's another. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Another bill with regard to or process whereby they're um, going to more register. I don't know if it's registration, whatever it is. Jeanette can speak to it of police officers, so that you know more you know, more quality, more training, all kinds of things going on. And I think that we're moving farther ahead and, and in doing a good job and getting Vermont where we hope it should be and, and is in many cases now. I think I'm glad the, um, that Jay was able to prevail in the Zulo case. Um, I remember that case well, it wasn't too far from me. And, you know, I'm glad that happened. So, but I mean, we're doing a lot of things to move police forward to kind of new era policing. So I think, um, not sure I want to go in this direction at this point. Okay. This well, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, so, I, is there anything, I mean, obviously I've asked Ben to do a redraft that we can look at either tomorrow or next or week after town meeting um and uh you, do you need any more direction from us then or me actually i guess i'm the one requesting it, it may be a one to three vote here um, um just a little clarification just so i'm i'm clear um and so what i've heard for the the additions is the taking a, an attempt to codify the zulu standard um, as as applied to constitutional violations, right? Everything uh, else remain as it is today. It's, it's my intent um, that all the other, you know, like stop signs. That I mean, you can't pat, you can't go down this road. And, you know, somebody gets sued because of something happens. Um, okay. That wouldn't be a constitutional violation. I don't think. Right. Yeah, it would just be the the rights, uh, immunities, and privileges guaranteed under the the Constitution of the State of Vermont. Yeah. So that's the only area. Well, it's a major area, but that's what would the bill would focus on. Yes. Is, is violation of the constitutional rights. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is uh, working on the frivolous lawsuit language to strengthen that yep. a little bit. Um, okay. Another. Another thing um, outside of just that provision that um, may also serve as a deterrent to frivolous lawsuits is something that New Mexico also did is the filing a notice of claim ahead of a lawsuit. Um, this is a concept where uh, someone would have a certain amount of time in, in New Mexico, I believe it's within a year of the incident occurring to file a notice of claim, basically putting the agency on notice of who was the alleged victim, the circumstances surrounding it, the damages, um, and, and serving that within that time period. And it's a condition precedent to filing a suit. So if it doesn't happen, um, the suit wouldn't, couldn't be filed. This is also something that many states, including New York, does uh, for claims against uh, you know, municipal government and, and things like that. So that could be another yeah. work in. Well, I'd, I'd love to look at that. There may be sections that more than that the majority of the committee supports and sections that the majority doesn't support. So we'll, let's see where what that looks like. That would be helpful. Okay. Um, and then um, working in a report of claims filed, um, an annual right. report to see 
really what's going on. Um, and, and for fear of opening up more cans of worms, my, my running tally of issues that have been raised um, are caps on liability, um, whether or not we want to... The, well, the I'd, I'd, I'd take out section on page three, section um, E. Okay, take that out. Yep, that's the... the so it would not affect an individual officer in okay, terms so, of personal liability. I think we heard a lot of testimony about that particular section not being um, that it would 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 create um, in terms of the test uh, in terms of what Senator uh, Benning and and Commissioner Sherling talked about. Okay, so no personal liability for the law enforcement officer could, um, with that, would could claims still be brought against the law enforcement officer, or is well, would it be a claim I guess against they, the body? I guess itself? they, I guess they can because you know we've got those claims, and I wasn't, I didn't want to ask David Slay about ongoing litigation, but he's defending a police officer on five million dollar claim, so. Because, uh, yeah, a, a way that it could be worked in is you could bring the lawsuit against the agency, the, the law enforcement officer, or, or both, but ultimately the, the agency would be, would fully indemnify law enforcement. Right. I don't want to change what that, I mean, if, if they can do it already. So um, I'm just not adding that $25,000 or um, 5%, whichever is less. Okay. suggesting we don't add that to the bill so but I, evidently um currently individual officers are being sued right um and one thing though is that we we could make it explicit that the right of action can be brought against um it, it, given this statutory construct let's that we're let's putting... it's already con confusing enough and i'd rather leave that to the the way it is today. Okay. Um, it, if some future judiciary committee wants to look at that issue, then they're welcome to it. Well, like I said, I was afraid of opening another can of worms on that. Well, that's a, that's a, that seems to be a can that we opened. I'd like to close right now um, <laughs> Fair in enough. terms of, of the bill that we would consider. Okay. Um, and then I know that there was talk about prohibiting or concern rather uh, of insurance carriers potentially bringing claims. Um, in the Vermont Tort Claims Act, they, there, there's a similar, there's a prohibition that's explicit about insurance carriers not coming after law enforcement officers for uh, reimbursement essentially. Um, that could be something that could be rolled in as well if, if the committee desires. I don't know what, I'm, I'm not clear. I, you can throw it in there as as something that might get thrown out. I'm not, I, I don't fully understand that. Okay, okay. Can you explain that a little bit better to me? And I don't sure. know that. So I, I believe in, in one of our early testimonies, um, it was a concern was raised that in the lawsuit, if insurance carriers could, um, after let's say a uh, payout was made, could then come after a law enforcement officer to reclaim any insurance payments if they had, say, a private insurance contract or a situation like that. In the Vermont Tort Claims Act, they have a prohibition of that. It says that basically insurance carriers cannot come after law enforcement officers for reimbursement um, under any private insurance contract that the, the officer may have. Um, you, mean in that individual, you mean an individual officer, not the department? Correct, correct. Um, you know, I, I guess with the answer before that, if they're not going to be personally liable, it may not ne be necessary to actually incorporate that provision. Yeah, I, I um, don't know if it is or not, but I, my understanding is, that, and I don't know for sure, but there's been at least three settlements in recent history in Bennington between the town and litigants. Um, and I'm assuming that that the uh, BLCT insurance pays that. I think that we had testimony on that. 
Yes, I, I believe that there was testimony on that. And and, and again, as I think through this and, and understand that we don't want the personal liability of the police officer, I think the need for a provision uh, prohibiting a, an insurance carrier from going after a law enforcement officer um, is probably not relevant at this point. I don't so. think it is, although going back to my $22,000 payment um, for my defense, um, I wish they had that there. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, that that uh, rounds out sort of my checklist of just concerns to make sure of what's in and what's what's out of the, the new draft. So there'll be the codification of Zulo for constitutional violations, strengthening the frivolous lawsuit language, uh, a notice of claim, and a um, report of claims filed. Something like New Mexico. Okay. Someday I'm going to get to New Mexico. It's one of the few states I've never visited. All right. Any other comments or questions before we adjourn for the day? Just a comment on New Mexico? Yeah, if you'd like, yeah. When um, we were setting up the, uh, the um, medical marijuana dispensaries, Mm -hmm. um our the legislature along the with bill the, you mean right bill yeah bill. yeah yeah the yeah. the legislature along with the um department of public safety did such a good job that when new mexico was setting theirs up my understanding is that they came to us and asked how to do it oh well having said all that Jeanette, senator baruth is landing in albuquerque right about as we speak <laughs> well let him investigate New Mexico. I hope he wears his clothes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got the right day to leave and not, not tomorrow. All right. Anything else? Peggy.